When I moved back to Amherst, Nova Scotia after 15 years away, something had changed. Like many other towns, our local businesses and business people had been overwhelmed by large corporations and monopolies. This hurt the spirit of our communities. We lost our autonomy, our self-reliance, and our hope. So join me as I learn more about where we are now, how we got here, and what we can do to take back our communities. I'm Andrew Cameron, and Monopolies Killed My Hometown. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 24 of Monopolies Killed My Hometown. I'm Andrew Cameron, your host. Today, we're talking housing. For all Canadians, you know we have really a housing affordability crisis. For anybody not from here, you just have to Google Canadian housing bubble and you will see so many articles, so much stuff, so many things about the situation we're in. And so today, that's what I want to look at and talk about and share what I've seen. Like I've been involved in the construction industry and the retail and rentals and property development industry for, well, 13 years. And I want to share with you my quick, informal, we'll say market study of the building supply industry around Amherst. My informal market study won't pass any rigorous academic requirements, but it does suggest there are more investigations needed to be done on the building supply industry and the manufacturing industry so that we can move forward and try to address our housing crisis. Because if it costs us five or six or $700,000 to build a new house, that is really hard to make it affordable. The math just doesn't work on that. So I'm gonna share my informal market study and then I'm gonna offer some things on what I wanna see the Competition Bureau and the federal government do moving forward from here. So I hope you enjoy this episode. So we're going to take a pause from looking at the industry section of the price spreads report because I want to talk about housing. Like I said in the intro, we have housing crisis in Canada right now. And so my promise, I guess, is that I'm going to keep this episode to about 20-ish minutes long, right? Like my professional background is from the construction, real estate development industry. And I have many thoughts on housing affordability and how we can actually solve the housing crisis in Canada. I mean, I can talk for hours about housing, but today I want to focus on consolidation, especially in construction supply industries, because I read two weeks ago, I think, St. Gobain, which is the parent company of CertainTeed, and it's a French global conglomerate, has reached an agreement to buy Building Products of Canada, a manufacturer of shingles. I don't remember what else they do right off. Anyways, neither of these company names may mean anything to you unless you're like me in the industry or always in and out of building supply stores or always looking at who manufactures the products and all those sorts of things. But this merger is a big deal because if it's allowed to go through, it's going to, or in my mind, it's going to make housing more expensive. It's going to make construction of housing more expensive. It's going to make renovations and repairs more expensive. And it's just going to contribute to continuously driving up the housing bubble we've got going on. And we're going to talk more about this in a bit, but we've got to come back to just sort of the housing crisis, the affordability crisis that we've got going on right now. Canadian housing market doesn't make any sense to me. You know, there's been a bubble for, it seems like ever, and this bubble for the longest time was centered around, you know, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, like the bigger cities. But in the last couple of years, it stretched down to Amherst. There was a 1960s bungalow down the street from where my grandmother lived that sold for over $300,000. You know, that may sound like a reasonable price to everybody else in the country or around the world, but four years ago, five years ago, if that house sold for one hundred and seventy, hundred seventy-five thousand, I would have thought somebody overpaid at that point. Like I said, that Canadian bubble spread all across the country and it's impacting us all. With that, there's also a shortage of rental properties. Like we build and rent apartments. And I know the size of the wait list we have. And I know the number of people that are calling always looking for something. And I know we could probably double the amount of units we have and no issue renting them. I also know that there's a number of businesses around that have looked to hire somebody and bring them to town. Um, I also know this has been an issue for doctor recruitment in Amherst is they want to bring them to town, but they can't find appropriate housing. 
let alone like people starting out looking to buy their first home and not being able to afford it or becoming house poor because of it. The housing issue is causing a whole lot of other challenges in our communities. And that's why I want to talk about it, because to have a strong community, people need a safe, secure, affordable place to live. We develop apartments now, and between 2015 and 2018, we accessed some programs with Housing Nova Scotia, which had CMHC money, to build affordable housing. So in the town of Amherst, we built 40 affordable units between 2015 and 2018. And so to put this in comparison, that's Amherst has a population of about 10,000. So that's, you know, four units per thousand people. Per capita, that's the equivalent of building about 1,600 affordable units in Halifax or 4,000 affordable units in Ottawa or about 24,000 affordable units in the GTA. And so for me, I look at this school, I am very proud of having built those units because I know the impact, the positive impact it's had on the tenants who live there now and the tenants who have lived there over the years since we built them. I also am keenly aware with the wait list that we've got that me building those units did nothing for actually solving and addressing the housing crisis and housing problem in Amherst or even across the country. And so this is one of the things that I think about. Like I always say at first, don't overcomplicate the housing affordability issue. Like at a high level, it is fundamentally math, right? CMHC, so the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which is a federal crown corporation focused on housing and increasing housing supply and a whole bunch of other research, a whole bunch of other things, has identified if you're spending 30% or less of your income, then it's, we'll say it's an affordable house. If you're spending more, it's unaffordable for you. So when I look at that, it, it's simple. The way to solve the housing affordability crisis is you either increase wages or you decrease the cost of housing. That's how the two variables have to move. The challenge is how you do either one of those. And that's where the real nitty gritty and you got to get down into the weeds and figure out what to do and come up with solutions that will actually work in the impact. But to make an impact on this, you either have to increase wages or lower the cost of housing. I'm going to talk just about the cost of housing. Consolidation and the impact on wages is a fascinating topic that deserves its own episodes. And again, I may get to it when, you know, again, in the price spreads report, they do a whole chapter on the impact of monopolies and consolidation on labor and wage earners. So I think that'll be a good way to get into it. The biggest solution for a housing crisis that keeps getting proposed is we need to just build more houses, increase the supply, increase the supply, increase the supply. So in 2022, CMHC released a report that said Canada needs to build 5.8 million homes by the year 2030 to bring housing back to an affordable level. So that's 5.8 million, eight years, 725,000 homes or apartments a year for the six major uh, metropolitan areas in Canada, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal. In 2022, there were housing starts of about 140,000 units. So if we need to build 725,000, that means the rest of the country had to have built about 600,000 units or about four times what were done in the six largest centers. So we have a lot of work to still do to get there. But one of the things that I find with this is it's just blanket housing starts. That's all that's talked about, not about the price of what those houses need to be or the cost of what the new houses need to be. Right, because I look at it and go, if the average house costs five hundred thousand, it's essentially saying how many houses above five hundred thousand dollars in cost do we need to build to bring the average house price down? And I look at it and go, just that is mathematically impossible. If the average price is five hundred thousand dollars, you cannot add any units above five hundred thousand dollars and bring the average cost down. Just mathematically impossible can't be done. To bring the average cost of housing down, you need to increase the supply of housing that costs less than the average price. That will bring the price down. So that's just one thing that's always kind of stuck with me when I hear this increased supply argument. I think the logic behind it is, is the hope or the thought that we will build enough supply that at some point the supply will far outstrip the demand. And then once that happens, that will naturally bring the price down. But I mean, if we needed to build 725,000 units, homes, whatever, in the last year, and we only did 125 in the largest six areas, I mean, we're not getting there. But if those 125,000 in the biggest centers were all below the average cost, that would help bring the cost down. 
And so when I look at this, the goal of building housing at or below the average cost, the current average cost, gets so much harder to do as construction costs continue to rise, right? And that's why we need to talk about the Cinco Ban and Building Products of Canada potential merger. Uh, side note, I will get a, people that are going to push back and say, you know, well, municipal fees, HST and other taxes being levied on real estate development and new projects is a big impediment to building affordable housing. And I say, sure, it absolutely contributes. Let's just not use that as a distraction from looking at consolidation in the private sector. So on my website, I wrote a post in December 2021 thinking about and looking at this issue. And I'm going to kind of revisit that post now. Because here in Amherst, there have been a large number of large apartment projects, like 50 units and above over multiple buildings, proposed to be looked at by different developers around. And one of the developers, the one that was proposing the largest development, was saying that their typical unit cost or what they budgeted is between two hundred and fifty and three hundred thousand dollars per apartment to build them. And I look at that and I go, you know, even if you take two hundred fifty thousand dollars per unit, if it costs you that much, it is hard to make the apartment affordable. Because I look at that, if it costs you two hundred fifty thousand dollars per unit, you have to rent them for at least two thousand, if not twenty five hundred, if not three thousand dollars a month. And compared to larger centers, that may be affordable, but down here, that is those are not affordable rents. And so, and I assume that even the costs in the larger centers are going to be higher and it's going to make it even more difficult to make housing affordable. And so for me, this was the thought behind my article in 2021 was to look at what's the competition level like in the building supply industries. When I say like the building supply or the construction supply industry, I'm talking like, you know, shingles, siding, insulation, drywall, electrical panels, breakers, concrete, cement, those sorts of things. I did my own sort of informal market study of around Amherst. Just, I was curious. It won't pass any academic rigor, you know, and nobody should really make any decisions on this, but to me, it does provide suggestions and conclusions that more information needs to be gathered and needs to be looked into. So what I did is I just looked and said, okay, around Amherst, within 45 minutes of Amherst, where could I go buy these things? And so I counted, there's 21 separate retail locations for building supplies within 45 minutes of Amherst. And so I'm not looking at, you know, like small household appliances, um, hardware, those sorts of things, basically leaving out Canadian Tire. And so what I found on the retail side is there were 21 stores, four of them are owned by Kent Building Supplies, which is owned by the Irving family, one Home Depot, 12 home hardware stores, but they were only owned by six different owners one Timber Mart store, and three other chains. You know, I think the other chains were like Castle Building Supplies, Acadian Drywall. I can't remember what the other one was. But Timber Mart is a buying group where independent stores join together in the buying group. And so then they can use their buying power to negotiate lower prices from the manufacturers and the wholesalers. Home hardware, I find, is an interesting one because the stores are individually owned and each store pays a marketing fee to home hardware and they typically buy all their products from the home hardware directly and from their distribution centers. And so when I look at it, I suspect there is a distinct power imbalance between the local store owner and home hardware, the corporate chain. So in my mind, in this analysis, I think really they all need to be grouped together as one retail chain, even though they're all individual owners. And so out of my simple count, 17 of the 21, or about 80% of the stores are the dominant retail chains. Kent, Home Depot, and Home Hardware. You know, or you could call them the mass buyers in chain stores. I can't get in and do a market share analysis based on sales because, I mean, I don't have that data. However, I am very confident in saying that the Home Depot or the Kent or the Home Hardwares in Moncton and in the Moncton area did more annual sales volume than the Castle Building Supplies in Mastown, Nova Scotia. I'm confident in saying that. And so for me, this informal market study leads me to think that the retail level of the building supply industry has been consolidated. And again, from all the episodes we did where we looked at the retail industry and what the price spreads commission found, you know, in the 1930s, consolidation in the rise of mass buyers and chain stores and the abusive practices that they have and what they use leads to increased prices for consumers. So I would suspect this has happened again, and this consolidation has driven up the costs of new home construction, renovations, repairs, and just general cost of owning housing. And is also going to be a factor in preventing us from 
building below average cost housing moving forward. And so for me, like I said, that was just looking at the retail level. And it's the same as, you know, I, I, I shared this quote a couple episodes ago from Corey Doctorow, you know, consolidation breeds consolidation. And again, the price spreads commission found that with the rise of mass buyers and chain stores also led to increased consolidation in the manufacturing side of things, the manufacturing industry. My inclination was seeing that there's consolidation at the retail level. I was curious, okay, I bet you we could find signs of the same consolidation at the manufacturing level. So I picked four items, shingles, asphalt shingles, vinyl siding, drywall, and insulation. I said, you know, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go see what I could buy from where I'm going to look at, you know, what are the different brands of these products I can buy and, you know, who actually owns them. And so here's my, here's my quick, again, informal analysis. So looking at asphalt shingles, I found there were four readily available brands. IKO, which is a Canadian owned company. Uh, I forget the name of the family, but they're one of the wealthiest families in the country now. Uh, GAF is available only at Home Depot. There's BP, which is Building Products of Canada Shingles, and Certainteed, which again, as I said before, is owned by St. Gobain. So if the St. Gobain BP merger goes through, we're now down from four readily available brands of shingles to three. So then I looked at vinyl siding. So in December 2021, you know, when I did my first scan again, I found there was four readily available brands of siding. KCAN, which was a privately owned Canadian company. ABTCO, A-B-T-C-O, uh, which was owned by KP Building Supplies, which I eventually found out was owned by KCAN. Uh, there's Mitten, which is owned by Cornerstone Building Brands. And Gentech, which is owned by Associated Materials Limited. So at that point, there was four brands, but really two of them are owned by the same company. So in effect, there are only three. But then in my research, I found that St. Gobain bought KCAN in 2022. So now St. Gobain owns two of the four readily available signing companies. They're going to own two of the four readily available shingle brands, right? So they're amassing a whole lot of power as well. So then I looked at fiberglass insulation. So there's two companies, Owens Corning, which is a U.S. company, and they sell the pink insulation. You know, their mascot's the Pink Panther. And then the other one is Certainteed. Again, they're back. St. Coban is back. They're one of the two dominant insulation suppliers. And then I looked at drywall. I was curious, Eastern Canada, what's the drywall situation like? So there's three readily available brands of drywall. There's CGC, which is now owned by Knopf Industries, a German conglomerate. Cabot Drywall, which is a locally owned drywall manufacturer. They also own a retail chain. And, oh, look, again, Certainteed, which is owned by St. Gobain. You can keep going. Like electrical panels and breakers are basically manufactured by three companies, Schneider, Siemens, and Cutler Hammer. Plastic pipe, like sewer pipes, really two, maybe three different companies. Like there is not a lot of competition at the retail level. But then when you go one step further, like I see even less competition there. And so again, the Price Spreads Commission found that consolidation in the manufacturing industries eventually led to increased prices to the end consumer. So in this case, we're talking increased costs of housing. And so what I say for me is the point of this analysis is it suggests that there is a lot of consolidation in the building supply industry. And if that is true and has been found, it suggests that it has raised prices for the end consumers on housing, real estate, repairs, everything. And as long as this is true and this is holding and this is the case, it's going to make it exponentially harder for us to actually get in and address and solve our housing affordability problem in Canada. So what do I want to see happen from here? First, I want to see the Competition Bureau challenge this proposed merger between St. Coban and BP. Like, just don't let this merger go through. It will only make the housing issue worse. I'd also really like to see them when they do challenge it, which I hope they will, and I think I think they will, that they broaden the scope out and talk about its impact on housing for people instead of just arguing about market share of retail shingles in Western Canada. No, like, get down to it. What is the final impact on people at the end of the day? That's what I would love to see them do. Second, if the federal government is 
serious about addressing the housing crisis and the housing affordability crisis, I want to see the federal government take this proposed merger seriously. Give the Competition Bureau market study power so that they can go out and compel information and really find out what's happening in all these industries. The federal government could also bring other departments towards this too. CMHC could get out and do a lot of research into, okay, what's happening in the cost of constructions? What's happened over the last 30, 40 years? Stats Canada can get involved and find out these things. Like we can bring a lot of other departments to look at this issue from this angle of consolidation building supplies, but there's a lot of other angles that they could look at. How has consolidation and monopolies impacted housing? But most importantly, like get the Competition Bureau the market study powers and their ability to compel information from people. Because what I see is if this consolidation is there and if it's driving up the cost of housing or contributing to drive up the cost of housing, we need to start unwinding it. We need to start doing this to give us even more tools and more of a chance to help and deal with our housing crisis. So that's what I want to see. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe or follow in Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening and come back in a couple of weeks. We're going to get back into the industry section of the price spreads report. So take care, everyone. What are you doing at the small town after the movie show through? A few powerful companies. Main Street is struggling. 